interested to hear what you and they say, what you have to say. Hey, this is, we really want it to be like question and yeah. answer. This he doesn't have 40 slides to show. So it's not like a slideshow, like a, a lecture. It's yeah. this question and answer. So I'll start with some questions, but, but feel, do feel free to, to ask. It's very informal question and answer. So I just wondered if you could tell us something about yourself and yeah, I can, I what think, you studied. I think I can just kind of go through. I only have like three slides. It's just kind of to introduce myself to you all, because I, I think I graduated a few years ago, and I don't think you guys know me. So um, I'm from Thailand, and I studied in CMS from fourth grade until 12th grade, and I graduated in 2015. And then after that, I took a gap year, and then I went to study in Edinburgh for um, my, undergrad, my undergraduate degree, and I did development, regeneration, and stem cells. And I graduated just this year, and then I'm going to go to uh, Vienna, Austria, to do my PhD soon. Yeah, so so that's me, and just a little bit kind of what I've done in science so far, um, besides just the studies. Then I did some research projects, just very basic, brief idea. So first, before I started my university degree, I worked for a year as a research assistant in, um, in CMU, uh, just kind of getting to know what science is like, what science research is like. I was culturing cells, I was helping them uh, do like viral infections, so they were working with HIV viruses, um, so I just kind of, most of the times I was just looking at what they were doing, um, didn't really do much myself because I didn't have a lot of experience. Then for the first summer um, in university, I worked, I had like a summer internship and I worked with multiple sclerosis. Then I worked, the next summer I worked with neural differentiation, so taking cells and putting it to like neurons, that kind of thing. And then I also, for my uh, last year, for my honors project, for the last kind of graduation project, I worked with organoids. Um, I don't know if you guys know organoids, but they're kind of like mini little organs grown in a, like a, in a lab, in a dish. And um, so I was working with mouse brain organoids. And then my PhD project, I'm going to be working with stem cells in tissues and studying what, how they react in normal like homeostasis like, and then how they react in injury. So that's basically kind of what I have done and what I will be doing um, and in like in the science world. Um, yeah, so just kind of stem cells, I guess you guys know. Um, and I just kind of want to give you like an idea of what the research is like so that it's kind of, I find it quite interesting. And this is kind of one of the reasons I went into a stem cell, a more research-based science degree. So first, like kind of the stem cells first, isolated in human and then they kind of they did reprogramming so when you first when you know that no, not everyone does oh, okay okay so tell us what stem cells oh yeah okay so a stem cell is a cell that has the ability to become any cell in your body so that's what we call embryonic stem cell but down the as they, they as they start to divide and become more specific to different parts of your body then they become what we call adult stem cells, so they're more limited in what they can become, right? So, um, so basically the cell that can become anything is very hard to, to obtain because it's kind of the first cell when your eggs and sperm meet, right? So it's, it's and when you do experiments with them, that's quite basically like killing an embryo. So it's kind of like in human, it's, it's not possible to do. So um, when they isolate it, they have to kill an embryo. So it's kind of like ethnic, no, ethically, um, kind of like challenging. So they, so then they try to what they do is they do reprogramming. So they take any cells in your body. They can take a skin cell, a muscle cell, or anything, and then they can convert it back to a stem cell. So then you can use these cells to do experiments and you know like study all the different things that happen. So that's pretty cool. And then. Um, in the lab next to my lab, they're also doing this kind of like reprogramming, so it's kind of 
interesting to know what how they've been doing and they can they can now take these stem cells and make any cell types in your body so they can and then they use these cells once they differentiate they once they form these like more specific cell types then they can put it back into your body and maybe help cure for example if you have a spinal cord injury right so you cannot walk because there's a, a like a, a damage in your spinal cord then if you can put some like nerve cells in there to connect it reconnect so maybe maybe it's po possible that you can walk again. It's that kind of potential use of the stem cell research that I'm interested in, and I think that's kind of the area, the field that I'm going into. Um, so they make like little organoids, and then if they can grow it bigger, then maybe they can make a replacement organ. They can put cells back into the body. This is called like regenerative medicine, and they can, they've done it with bones. They're trying, anyway, trying to do it with bones. That, they can grow bones in a dish and they're trying to see whether they can reinsert these bones to help, or like cartilage to help with people with arthritis or something like that. So I think that's the field that, that's what um, motivates me to go into this like research field. And um, yeah, so that's kind of where I come from, my background and also what I want to do in the future, yeah. If any guys have questions, I can also answer any questions about studying in the UK because I did study in Edinburgh for three years, um, and I did science. I did like that kind of thing. So if anyone has any questions or interested in studying in the UK, I can also help. Yeah. So your, your transition from being in CMIS to being in Edinburgh University. Yeah. How well prepared do you feel you are? I think. Well, I, because I'm very like specific towards biology, so AP biology was really helpful to me. Um, I didn't take a lot of outside courses because um, I didn't like based on the structures of my course, it wasn't. I wasn't really allowed to take outside courses, so AP biology was the thing that I found very like was very helpful because it really gives a background of biology and. But also, you have to know that like university level biology or university level courses will be a lot different, a lot different from high school. And um, I went straight into second year, so my course is supposed to be four years, but I skipped one year because I took AP classes and I got credits for that. So I took like I saved a lot of money, saved all the tuition fee, living expenses because I took AP classes and I used those scores to apply and they kind of looked at my scores and equated it to saying that, oh yeah, I passed first year university. So therefore, it was very helpful. So that's why I think it's, that's in Edinburgh. I don't know about other universities though. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned you were doing a PhD in Edinburgh. Are you guys all interested in biology or what, what kind of like an audience do we have? I've got a question about yeah. studying in university. In what way is learning in a university different from learning in a high school? Um, so, from my experience, in high school you're kind of like taught, you're kind of given a lot of guidance, right? So when you don't understand, you can come back to the teacher and ask about anything you don't understand. Um, and you have textbooks, everything you can find in textbooks answer. You can find when you search the internet and you can like watch YouTube videos where they help you explain everything to you. But when you go to universities, basically all these things is not enough. Like you have to be on your own and study on your own. I was reading, I was going to lectures where one lecturer was giving a talk to about 300 students. Each class had each of the lecture course has about 300 students plus. So you don't have those kinds of like one-on-one -on -one interactions with the teacher where if you, don't, if you don't understand something in the course, you can raise your hands and ask, can't do that. So you just have to sit and take everything in and hopefully you can take as much in as possible. And, but if you don't get it, you still have to kind of go back by yourself and learn as much as you can. So you, ha you're, you have to be the one to seek help the teacher's not going to come to you and be like, oh, you didn't do well on this test. Here, let me help you. It doesn't happen like that in university anymore. So it's kind of, you're on your own. They don't really 
care if you do well or not, it's up to you to kind of gain as much as you can. It's, you have to seek out all the things that will help you. So I think that's, that's the thing that was very different from um, being in CMS versus being in university. And I think, yeah. Mm, what else? Yeah. So in stem cells, a lot of the research is based on finding um, cures for for conditions or diseases yeah. in humans, and a lot of the tests you said you work with mice. Yeah, I work with mice. I just wondering like, what that process was like when you found that these are our experiment results and how can get that into the public and use this? Oh, I think, so I've learned that um, for everything you do in mice, right? So it's kind of easier because mice is like small, it's um, genetic, is kind of similar. Um, and then you can grow many generations very quickly. So you can do genetic testings and all that stuff. But you know, mice and human, very different. And I think the process of finding something that works in mice, sometimes when they test it out in humans, they do clinical trials. They test it out in humans, it still doesn't work. Like it can have a lot of side effects that you don't get in mice. Um, and a lot, there are different stages of clinical trials as well. So some things that you find is successful in mice for treatment can take up to like 20 years to, be, to get to test in humans. And you don't even know that when you test in humans whether it's gonna have long-term effects or not. So all these tests, they, they want to push it so that you can get to human testing um, so that at least you can have help someone maybe. And I think that's kind of, I want to work towards that, that stage. And, yeah, hopefully something will come out of it. I don't know. Yeah, but it, it does take a long time, and new treatments do do take a long time. Even with drugs, it's yeah. So um, yeah. Yeah. So I have a question about the stem cell. So when you do the lab, is that you the cell lines, tissue cells? Um, I've worked with both. I've worked with cell lines, and I've worked with. Um, primary cells. So I've done when I was doing work on multiple sclerosis, um, I was taking uh, like cells from mouse brains. So I was dissecting and um, getting the cells. So I was culturing for each experiment. I would have to do dissection. So I was doing primary like those kinds of things. And um, but for like embryonic stem cells, those kinds of things, you you it's easier to use cell lines because it's a lot of like. Variability each time you have to do dissections and to get out the, all the embryonic stem cells. So I, I think there's like people use mixed um, ES cells, uh, use like cell lines and both primaries. So it depends on kind of what, what you do with your experiments and what you kind of want to test, I think. Yeah. yeah. And out, and I take three SAT subject test: biology, chemistry, and math. Um, I think I got 800, 800, 750. And then I took five APs that I applied with: um, bio, chem, AP English language, uh, lit. What was the next, last one? Calculus. Yeah, calculus. I got all fives except one four in English. Yeah. So. <laughs> but you know, like it's 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 like a lot of work to to get like that kind of you know like to be able to. But I mean, 
in the end, it was really helpful, right? I got to skip like one year of university I saved. A tuition fee was like over 20,000 something pounds. So I saved a lot of money for my parents and living expenses on top of that. Was, so in the end, like it was really helpful. And I don't think, I don't, I don't, like in the first few weeks of being in university, going straight into second year, it was kind of intimidating because everyone already had one year of university experience. And um, whereas I didn't, and suddenly I was going to classes where people, they expect you to know certain things. And um, there was a lot of like, there was a bit of kind of adjustment period where I tried, I, for, each exper for each assignment I was studying so hard and I was doing so much. But then I found out that like, I was doing too much. Like, you know, try to like keep up. I was doing too much compared to like the students who were in first year because they were, um, in the UK or in, in Scotland, the first, in Scotland, because it's four years of university, the first two years don't really count towards your final um, year mark. So students weren't studying so hard, so you know, like that kind of thing. So I guess like I was, I was trying to make sure that I wasn't left behind. Um, so I guess that like, and in that sense, it helped me kind of settle into university without worrying too much about like my grades because then I was like I was working hard but in I think the AP levels kind of helps you get to know like the the basic is enough for like the basic um, courses in university because the first year courses AP is supposed to be equivalent to first year university courses anyway so if you do well it's it should be um, helpful when you go to university and study We had a lot of last year's graduating class who went to study in the, who are about our starting study in the UK now. Yeah. I just wonder how you found it. How um, you found it? How life, I found in life in the UK. Life in uh, it was really different. I think the first year. Uh, so there's like the, the studying aspect, and there's also like the social aspect of it, right? So studying, like I said, it was. You know, you have to, you, you're on your own, kind of, you have to study. So it's, it's hard to first just go from CMS where like teachers are there to help you and your classes are so small. Like if you're in a class of about 20 to 30 students or about that size. Where, and then you suddenly go to universities where you're in a class with like 300 students and you don't even know how to make friends with so many people. So there's that aspect where you're, you're very on your own. But once you get over that and you know what you have to do for yourself to make it work for you, then studying in universities is quite, it's quite fun. It's, it's, it's a challenge, but once you kind of, you want, you kind of like feel that you want to tackle this challenge, then you feel the drive and motivation to do it. And I think that's what you have to do when you study in university and you're on your own. Um, and then the other social aspect of studying in the UK uh, is, is it's, uh, it's different where, because university in the UK, there are so many students and then the drinking age is like 18. So you go in and suddenly everyone can like go out, drink and um, all the, the, do like all the parties and everything. And so you have to find your group of friends where you know, like they go out the same amount as you, they drink the same amount as you, you know, so you don't like suddenly be stuck with a group that drinks too much and you're like, oh no, I'm not drinking that much. Or you're in a group where they don't drink at all and you're like, oh no, like I don't want to be like that either. So, you know, you have to find your groups and I think um, going to, I think universities everywhere will have the same things. They will have like societies, clubs, um, you know, like all the like groups of people that are already there and it's helpful for you to join because then you have some common interest that's outside of what you study. So I joined table tennis, I know some people from badminton, I joined Thai society, um, so I get to know like not just biologists, I get to know like all these other people um, and it gives me kind of like a break of just talking about science all the time, every single day. Like, I, I live, my flatmates are both biologists as well. One is an immunologist and one is a cell biologist. So at home, when we're having dinner, we talk about work. 
and then we study together and then when we have when we something doesn't work in the lab we come back and we talk about it so it's everything is the same you have the same talk every day but like it, you get to go to these like sports and society events and just kind of shut off for a minute and do something else and that help is very helpful for like the stress um, so I think that the, that aspect where if you find a group of friends that kind of match you have to find a group of friends that match and once you find it it's it's easy it's like then it's it becomes really fun and less stressful and it's yeah it's fun. yeah so Um, I think I'm also not a college like admissions team. <laughs> but what did you do Yeah, um, so I think it I think it depends where you're applying to. In the UK it's, the application is more like education based. So I applied with grades, then I had to write only one essay. And in the essay they tell you what they want in that essay. So they tell you why you have to write first, um, kind of why you want to study this course. Then you have to explain what you've done to prove that you can study in this course or to prove your passion for this course, that kind of thing. So I think for in the UK, it's, it's very specific of what, and they just want these things. Like they want, what course are you interested in? Why are you interested? And this is what I've done to show that I'm interested. This is like my story. Like you know, you have to build your own story. They, they, they're less. They look less about the the extracurricular. They, I mean, I think like extracurriculars that, for example, in the UK, they if they were gonna look for, it would be like for, you have to be extra, extra, extra like good at it. You know, if you were gonna apply with, I don't know, like other like outside activities, then you have to be like national level so something then they can like consider but if if other because otherwise they're just these are the only things that they are looking for that they you have to apply for with I mean so I applied with all those grades that I told you about and then I also applied with um, my like community service um, work I was working at the school of the blinds um, I was kind of I tutored and I also like helped teach the blind students, and um, so I added that to my story and made my application look very like beautiful, kind of. You know, I was like, oh yes, uh, I worked with the blind students. Um, my grandmother has Alzheimer's, and this kind of like in like inspired me, motivated me to work in regenerative medicine, so that I can use stem cells and maybe like work in a way that can form a treatment for these people and help. You know, like I was like very pretty. That kind of thing. It's like what they're looking for. So yeah. So I think that's. It depends on where you are applying and what you're applying for. But in the UK, it's because you apply with. Um, I think if you're looking to UK, then you apply with UCAS, right? So you have one application you send to five different universities, and you choose your courses for each university, and this just goes. This one application goes. So you have to make your application kind of general enough to go to all different universities so you just talk about yourself and why you're interested what you're interested in this is what i've done this is how i've shown that i'm very good at what i'm doing that's that's the uk application i think it's different in the us as well it depends on where you're applying what makes it good will depend yeah. 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 how do you manage your finances in the university um, so I was, I was um, funded by my parents for my tuition fee and also living expenses. Um, so they gave me, they transferred me kind of, kind of semesterly. So I had to do accounting and had to budget like per month. And I also worked uh, part time in a Thai restaurant in Edinburgh. Um, so I got some extra money to just spend for myself. That was my money saved for trips or that kind of thing. And I also worked at Thai restaurants so that I could get free Thai food, which is great because <laughs> I cannot cook. So, <laughs> so it was like a way to kind of just also kind of be a little bit more independent. Um, 
from my parents because otherwise I would have to report to them every single thing that I was wanting to spend. And then if I have my own money, then I don't have to do that. So I guess that's how I just, you have to kind of find out how much you usually spend a month and then kind of stick to it and don't go over because then the next month you will suffer a little bit, which I have done, so <laughs> I don't recommend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's not too hard. I think you can manage. I think everyone will learn. Uh, okay. Now, okay, when you're done for the tech, um, undergrad, and then you will go to the, get the scholarship, yeah. and then also to the PhD, how did you get it? Oh, it was so hard. It was so hard. I think, like, because I, um, I, my undergraduate degree is self-funded, and so if I was going to do a master, I would have to be another year of self-funded. And masters, for especially for international students, is quite expensive. So I knew that if I did a PhD, PhDs are usually sponsored and you're also paid to do it. So it's kind of like a job. Um, so I was like, okay, I need to try to get a PhD. <laughs> so there are only, and when, within the UK, there are only a few PhD programs that you can apply to. Um, so I think like, and all, wait, one more thing is that with a master's in the UK, it's only one year, so you, it feels like you're just doing, it's, when you do a master, you just get another year of lab experiences. Um, but then it's for some people, like my friend who chose to do a master, she chose it to do a master because she didn't really know whether she wanted to stay in science or not. But I kind of knew that this is what I want to stay. So I want to do a project which was gonna kind of be a longer project and actually do something. Because when it's only a year where, and you have rotation, so you're only doing half a year for each project, it's a very short period of time to do anything. Um, so that's why I chose to do a PhD rather than a master as well. And also, um, uh, with a PhD, then when you're applying for a PhD in the UK, there's only, as an international student, there's only a few that you can apply for. And because there's so many international students applying, so it becomes really, really competitive. I was applying to, I think, like five, six programs, and I didn't get in to any of them. I went to interviews for some, and um, wasn't, I guess, wasn't really that prepared for, and so I didn't get in. And um, the one that I got in and that I'm going is the one I wanted from the beginning, and it was the last one. I had nothing, and this was my only one left. So I had to get it. Like I came in the with the idea that if I don't get this, I'm going home and doing nothing. So I had to, I had to get it. Um, and so I, I think like to prepare for this PhD in like an interview. So you apply, and then after that they look at your application, and then they call you in for an interview. And then um, after the interview, then they'll kind of let you know whether you get it or not afterwards. And when I went to the interview, before I prepared for the interview, I spent a month of just being on my own in my room, preparing for this interview, had no contact with the outside world, um, because it was my last chance. And yeah, and it was really stressful, but in the end, like, it worked out. And yeah, I, I guess like, it takes a lot of time to kind of, first, you have to know whether you want to do a PhD or not, because if you don't want it enough, then I guess it's not worth the hassle of like going through all that like application. But because um, it, it's it's not easy for anyone um, that I've like talked to. Masters is also not easy to apply for. As well. So I think it's like it depends on what you want to do. After. So you, you have to prepare like that you have lab uh, during when you study in the yeah. 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 So I, I was doing um, in each summer that I was. I didn't come home during the summers because in the summer I was doing um, placements in the lab. Um, so every summer that I, I was there, I did placements, and I did it for about two months to three months. And for some, I got paid, and some I worked in the Thai restaurant to kind of sponsor myself. And um, so this kind of experience helps you to apply for a postgrad study as well, because then it gives you kind of the lab experiences that a master's student would have. You know, 
know, so you're kind of equivalent. I've done two years, and then another two years, and then an honors project for about four months. I mean, uh, two months, two months, and another four months. So I was kind of like equivalent to what a master's student would have for a year of like lab work. So that's why I think it, I could get in with just a bachelor degree, when other, whereas other people would have to do a master's because it's then it, it kind of equal equalizes the experience level. Um, and yeah, that's, that was really helpful. And also it's really fun because then you get to, as an undergrad, you don't really get to do much, but you get to go into these labs and you get a small project, you know, like you, your project is not like very big or anything. So it's usually a small project that's part of somebody else's like PhD work. And then you get to work on this project while learning about what your supervisor is doing, what your supervisor's friend is doing, what other people in the lab are doing, and also what the next lab is doing. So you get to go in and really experience what it's like to work in the field um, at a very early stage. So that helped me decide that, yeah, I want to stay in science and this is what I want to do afterwards um, as a work. So I, and whereas some people, if they don't do that, then they don't know what it's like to work in a lab and they don't have that experience of, you know, like this is what studying science will, in research will end up being. So I think if you guys want to go into research, I really recommend that like you kind of find a lab to work in for a placement, two months, whatever, like a month, two months, whatever, and then just do it like every year and have an experience. It helps. Yeah, it helps in your CV, but it also helps you to decide whether you want to stay in this career path or not. Um, yeah. Hey, yeah. Final No, no, no. Like, I mean, in high school, it's difficult because in like here, we don't have like CMS doesn't have like a research institute. For you, whereas in universities, they have an associated research institute, and your professors are usually. Uh, like a group leader, so I'll, they will, your professor will have their own lab. So if you like some some of the things that they're teaching, then usually what you do is you just email them, saying like, oh yeah, this summer, do you have a space in your lab that I can like go in and join, and maybe you have someone to supervise me, that kind of thing. So and then sometimes they can help you find funding so that you can get paid to do these like small work, small projects that you do over the summer. And um, so, that, yeah, so it's easier in university to do that kind of thing in the summer. Um, you just contact any, any lab, like, groups that you're interested in. And it's usually going to be around campus area. And it's easy to go see and go see what they're doing, learn, from, learn some techniques. And, you know, like, it's, it's, it's helpful. Yeah. Was it difficult to get these placements? Um, yeah, I think I think it does become. Yeah, I, I think it does get competitive, but um, but there are of course like because it depends on whether the the lab that you're interested in will have a place for you because then they have to pay for all this work that you will be doing. Um, and also depends on whether there are other people who might be interested in the same lab that you are interested in. And usually there are like a few students who would be kind of looking in the same lab, and um, you just need to be very convincing and very enthusiastic and very happy and yeah, I can do this, you know. Like you, you, I think that's like the helpful bit that you have to like convince them to kind of take you in. But it's not, but you're just competing with a few other students. Whereas if you're if you don't have any experience at all and you suddenly want to apply to continue working in a lab, then you're competing. Like if you're doing a PhD, then you have to compete with like 500 people. Whereas here, you can just start at a small competitive level and then slowly build up. And I think, um, yeah, I think it takes time. So you have to. When I was applying, when I was looking for a lab to work as a placement, I was applying to. I was emailing a few group leaders at once and then going to talk to them one on one, so having like a mini interview. Um, so I have to go talk to a few and see whether I like them and they like me. So it's not just, it's not a one, it's, it's not that, oh, you have to apply and they have to like, you have to make them like you. No, it's also that you have to like what they're doing. You have to like their style of teaching, of supervising, and you have to like the people in the lab 
as well. Because what if you suddenly go in, yeah, you're interested in what you're doing, but suddenly the supervisor's not there to supervise you and no one in the lab cares about what you're doing and they, they cannot help you, then you're on your own and that's not very good at all. So I think when you're, when you're looking for a lab, which I do recommend, you have to look at all these other aspects as well. That maybe this lab you're interested in, because it happened to me once that I was really, really interested in this one lab because I really liked what the supervisor was doing. And I went to talk to the supervisor but I didn't like the people that were in the lab. I didn't like the environment. And the super I didn't like the way the supervisor was talking to me. Like he made me feel like I was a student. Whereas, you know, like you, he made me feel, he made himself feel like, oh yeah, I'm the teacher and you're the student. But I wanted, even though, yeah, I was a student, I was an undergrad, but some professors, if you can find a really good one, they will teach you to be a scientist. They will not teach you to be a student. You know, they will teach you and learn so that you can learn all these techniques so that one day you will be equal to them. They will not teach you in a way that keeps you lower, you know? So I think you have, it's just, if you, if you go look for one, you start talking to them, then you will know, oh yeah, this is the person I like to work with and this is kind of an area I'm interested in. Therefore, it's a match and it's good, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. How does it feel like to be Um, so I think it depends on what you like and kind of, w yeah, what you prefer in your working life, right? So working in a lab, it's very, there's no nine to five, it's not a nine to five job. So you can go in because we don't, well, in the lab that I was in, it depends on also the supervisor, but in the lab that I was in, people would come in at like three in the afternoon and leave at 5 p.m. So they were in the lab for two hours and that's fine. As long as you finish your work, it's okay. So maybe this today I will have a lot of work to do. So I have to come in early and I leave late. But on another day, maybe I don't have as much to do. I just come in and feed myself. So I have to only be in there for 30 minutes. So it's okay. So it's that, I really like that aspect of it that I don't have to be in all the time. And if I don't have anything to do, I can just go home. I can also work from home. So, but, and no one really, comes and checks up on you whether you're in or not, they, they don't take your attendance. And so I, that's what I really liked about it, but also when you're working in a lab, you have to manage your own time. Because um, again, no one is gonna be there to be like, hey, did you do this experiment? What is the result? Did you get it yet? That kind of thing. They just come, you meet with your supervisor maybe once a week or once every other week, or if you have a lab meeting once a week, that kind of thing, where you just go over what you've done, and you have to have something to tell them. You can't just be like, oh, did experiment didn't work this week, and then next week, <laughs> experiment also didn't work. <laughs> it's because I wasn't in, <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. So then they'll be like, oh, why, were, why did it work? Did you like, you know, like it's, you have to do a lot of like working and thinking and discussing, but you're kind of, you have your own project and you get to manage everything by yourself, and that's what I really enjoy, because I don't like having to go to a desk job and sitting there for like nine to five and doing all that stuff. And I think for me, like doing lab work is like, it's fun, you know, like you get money to do all these experiments that finds out something that no one's found out before. So like you get to do, like you get to play with all these like cool things like cells and like bacteria, you get to infect viruses and stuff. It, I think it's really fun and you get paid to do it. You don't have to, you know, and you get to stay in aircon room all the time. <laughs> Lab is cool. <laughs> so it's nice. I think it's, for me, I, I really enjoy it, but some people, they don't really like that kind of work because when you're in a lab, you sometimes you may have to come in on a weekend. Sometimes you have to stay really late. Sometimes you have to come in. Like my friend uh, was doing, my supervisor was doing live imaging. So he was taking images of cells as they differentiate from normal, like embryonic stem cells to, um, I think he was doing mesoderm cells, but he was taking image every three hours. So every three hours for 24 hours, he would have to come in. So he was coming in at then like nine o'clock at 9, 9 p.m. and then another time at um, midnight, another time at 3 a.m. So it's, you have, because this is part of your experience, then you cannot complain, you have to come in and do it. So I think, you have the ability to manage your own experiments, but then this is like the downside is that you, you know, you have, you may have to come in on the weekend to 
make sure your cells are alive and well. You may have to come in on the weekend or at night to do all these things, and uh, that's just that's just an experiment of like that's part of the lab work. But it's I think it's like if you like what you're doing, you don't mind doing these kinds of things. I asked him, I was like, why do you have to plan experiments that you have to check every three hours? He was like, yeah, because I was interested. And I said, you don't mind coming in at like 9 p.m., 10, midnight and 3 a.m. in the morning and another time at 6 a.m. And he was like, no, I don't really mind. I live really close. It's kind of fun. I want to see what it's like, so I do it. And I think if you have that mindset, then doing science is great because then you're on your own, you get, to, you get paid, you get, you know, everything is fun because you find all these interesting things. And that's what science is like. That's what working in a lab is like. I think, yeah. So you might have one last question. Yeah. So you're going to go to Austria. Yeah. And you get your PhD. Yeah. So, then, so you're successful and you discover wonderful, fun, new things. You graduate from your PhD. Do you anticipate that you could come back to Thailand and continue research? Um, or has yeah. CMAS contributed to the brain drain? I think from, um, so for, for me, with the course of like right now, I want to kind of work in my PhD and see what will come out of it. And then maybe kind of work further abroad first because that's where the hub of this kind of like stem cell research and regenerative medicine is so I want to really like know something and maybe then I can like come back and develop something here so that I can help the people here as well so then you know like I can so that the hub is not only in Europe where you can, or like in in the US where it's where it's not accessible for people in Asia then you can that if people go there to study and learn and bring the techniques back, then people around this area can be helped as well. And I think that's, you know, like, so you kind of just spread the knowledge out a little bit. And I think that's, that's kind of what I have in mind right now. But it, again, it's, it's still so far away because right now I don't even know if I can finish this PhD because it's like people, people do, they go in, they're very excited. And I also see that people like in science, when an experiment doesn't work, you know, like when you when you hope something works, but when an experiment doesn't work, it's very like sometimes can get really de demotivating. Every single if like you, this experiment doesn't work, and then you try something else, and it still doesn't work. You just have to kind of be able to understand. Okay, think about it and understand why it doesn't work, and you know, go through it. And but some people, for some people, that's like very demotivating, and they lose the motivation to continue. And um, I. I hope that I will not be like that. And um, yeah, so I think like for now, I just want to kind of do something and get something out of my PhD that can be helpful and con continue further on. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, like, I just want to add that stem cell research. Like, yeah. How close like, or far are we from generating a full organ or organ Um. So I think people have done like, I know, I know people have done like cornea, so like the top of your eye, and also the retina. They've done like retinal organoid and they've replaced the retina. So they've done that. So like, but those organs are small, right? If you're thinking about like veins, a heart, like long bones, it's not yet there, simply because we cannot find a way to like if I'm growing, like for what I experienced with brain organoids, right? So I was working with mouse. The mouse brains are also really already very small. And, but what I found was that I was growing organoids and they started dying on the inside. So there was no nutrients that got in. So I think that's still an issue with brain organoids. They try to vascularize it by like implanting it, but you cannot grow a fully formed brain and replace it yet. And because of all these like um, caveats, um, that cannot yet be overcome. So I think like if you can, if in the, I think people are still working towards that. They're trying to grow in something small first and slowly growing from something small and putting it in your body and see whether that helps. And then they slowly like learn and try to grow something big and then maybe they can do that in the future. But I think with smaller organs, they, f they can do that already. Yeah. Yeah. I hope 
this was like interesting and I hope that this did not um, deter you from science. I hope it was interesting, guys. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.